Hello, um, I'm Sushant. I work for Hortonworks, and this is Mithun, uh, who works. I, I work at Yahoo. And we've both been working on the Hedge Catalog project, which was an um, Apache incubating project for a while that uh, got absorbed into the Hive uh, Apache project. And to a large extent, um, it's been an interesting journey, and we hope we can kind of share a bit of that with you and also talk about uh, what interoperability means um, for people in the Hive ecosystem. Um, roughly, what we are going to try to cover in this talk is um, kind of start off with uh, you know, the broader ecosystem we do live in, which is the Apache Hadoop uh, world, um, and then try to uh, work out where Hive fits into that, um, what Hedge Catalog brings to that picture, and generally what kind of APIs and, and services help you connect to various other tools. Um, then we'll quickly talk, Mithun will work us through a use case um, that uh, he's been working on at Yahoo. Um, it's called Project Starling. And uh, if we have time at the end of it, we'll also talk about a new recent initiative called Project Stinger, which is trying to um, kind of bring Hive to the, uh, uh, update Hive with the latest workings on Apache Thais and things like that. Um, before I continue, I'd just like to get a quick you know, show of hands. How many few people are very familiar with what happens inside MapReduce? Okay. Um, so well, good. We'll actually go through and describe what it is that uh, we wind up doing in MapReduce a bit, I guess. Um, so a good way to start really is usually with a Wikipedia definition uh, of what an ecosystem is supposed to be. Um, and what, uh, what really speaks to me about the definition here is that we're talking about a community of living organisms and um, their interactions with other non-living components. Um, and it is useful to me to kind of think of Hadoop as the biosphere, the, the base uh, uh, system that is in place. Um, I think of HDFS as essentially the resources that are available. And all the projects like Hive and Pig and whatnot are your living beings trying to interact with each other and living off what resources you have available to you. And, you know, so basically what happens is, um, as with any uh, other system, you want to not be a silo. You want to be able to communicate across different platforms. Um, the Apache Hadoop ecosystem broadly started off with um, two primary uh, projects. One was HDFS, the other is the MapReduce framework. The HDFS um, is pretty core to everything that we do uh, in the Hadoop world. Um, it gives you a good fault-tolerant uh, distributed file system. It takes care of things like trying to figure out data locality and trying to figure out um, you know, that your, your processing moves to your data in, in extent in conjunction with something like MapReduce. Uh, the MapReduce framework itself is kind of the magic behind the scenes. Um, and I know everyone starts off uh, describing Hadoop with a word count example that never really spoke to me. So I will start it off with a slightly different example, one of anagrams. And let's say we were trying to you know, talk about uh, what it is that MapReduce really does for us. And we had a dictionary of words, um, these particular words, um, that you know, uh, we're trying to figure out groups of anagrams in this list. And so well, I mean, just eyeballing it, we can see act and cat are anagrams. Dog doesn't have anything to go along with it in this list. And you know, there's a bunch of others that uh, exist as well. And we want to group them, essentially, as groups. So you know, the first thing that you think of when you come across something like this is, OK, so you can come up with a hash map of, uh, what do you say, entries, where a key is something that is common across the entire groups that you're trying to identify. And the value is just a list of all the things that have that same key. And the trick is really coming up with what's appropriate for that key. And essentially, you know, if we wanted to have a representation of what our desired result is, it's this. So great, you know, it's easy enough to code up something that, uh, what do you say, puts words into a hash map by, say, something like sorting the list of, uh, what do you say, words that we have and getting keys for them. But what if your hash map is too big uh, to fit in memory? Well, one of the first things that you can do is, clearly, you can kind of just make sure that you're emitting only one key value at a time and not trying to do any sort of grouping. And then you can try and sort it later. And the distributed merge sorts and things like that will help you do that. 
And then once you have that, you can, you can kind of be assured that um, adjacent uh, uh, values in that stream are all going to have the same key, and then you can do some sort of grouping, which is a lot more memory efficient than trying to put everything in one large hash map. And so, well, this form of thinking about things where your first step is essentially some sort of mapping, some sort of finding a commonality um, that kind of helps you group or classify a bunch of, uh, what do you say, uh, you know, uh, items. And then um, to split, uh, split that problem up so that it is parallelizable. And then for each parallel fork, so to speak, uh, you kind of can apply some sort of other function that basically tries to summarize or try to, uh, what do you say, uh, reduce. And your vocabulary is going to uh, differ based on which world you come from, you know. Uh, uh, so this sort of computation is what makes MapReduce tick. It's what MapReduce uh, really is. And MapReduce is also a framework that enables this sort of computation where you can simply write one function or a class that implements a mapper and another that implements a reducer and then set it in motion. And um, associated with that is also this notion of data locality, which is primal. And, you know, um, obviously this is important for jobs that are large enough so that your, you know, data size do not fit in memory. And that's really where I draw the line at what makes big data. Um, so essentially, in a broad basis, we'll come back to this later on, uh, you have some sort of preparation, and then you wind up uh, splitting your input data, and there's an input phase, so to speak, that happens. And I'm de deliberately calling it an input phase rather than a map phase for now. Um, and there are mapper functions that basically run on that input data that are doing various, uh, you know, data massaging on it. And then you have uh, what I consider to be the elephant in the room that is a sort shuffle phase that no one really talks much about, um, but we'll get to that in a bit. And basically, um, there's some sort of data massaging that, uh, I mean, movement that happens across the board, and then you have some sort of grouping and aggregation that happens. And maybe you have something else over here. So you have an input side and an output side to this. And associated with that, MapReduce defines a couple of formats, a couple of interfaces called uh, input format and output format, which if you implement, uh, you can actually do a lot, you can do uh, what is essentially I.O. in Hadoop from a, a perspective of a higher, uh, you know, higher level tool. So, you know, what is Hive? Hive, if I put it down really concisely, is a database engine that works on Hadoop. And I like the term database engine because it speaks to a lot more than saying that it's a data warehousing infrastructure, which is where these come from. I mean, a data warehousing infrastructure, broadly speaking, has this notion of feeds and data and input and output and, you know, extract, transform, loading, that sort of a thing. Um, so basically, um, you have that kind of a notion. But when you say something is a database engine, you're talking about a little more. You're talking about the notion that your data is fundamentally tabular in nature, um, that there is some sort of strong uh, schema to things. Um, and you also have this notion of storage and abstractions. Remember when I said that, you know, you have an input side and an output side? Well, there are multiple implementations of input formats and output formats, and some people might want to store data in a columnar format. Some people may want to store it as uh, JSON because they just imported it from some other external system. Some other people may want to, uh, what do you say, uh, export it to a database. So that is kind of free form to an extent. Um, we want it to be metadata driven. And, and when I say metadata driven, I mean that um, the notion of what your table is and how to read it and how to write it, or what kind of optimizations exist on it, are all stored in some sort of meta store. And this is available to anybody that is using that meta store. Um, it need not be, you know, Hive itself. And not all metadata is evil. Um, it's, it's based on SQL, uh, which means, well, Traditionally, Hive has always called itself HiveQL. Uh, I mean, the query language that works with it, HiveQL, and it's not claimed SQL, but you know, that's kind of just mostly kidding ourselves there. Uh, it's forever been trying to get closer and closer to SQL. It's been uh, adding new features most recently, especially even things like authorization and all that, that try to work on a SQL standard form, um, and it's forever trying to go there. And so Hive essentially is trying to work on this notion of 
being a database engine that works on top of uh, Hadoop. And you know, other tools that exist that have also uh, kind of been uh, competitors in some sense for Hive, um, other kinds of uh, metaphors and communities that kind of compete with Hive, if you will. Um, you know, let's look at each of them to an extent. You have, well, Pig. Uh, Pig is, uh, uh, I used to work in Yahoo, and you know, one of the things is Yahoo is a huge Pig shop, and um, the notion of being able to, uh, that Pig can kind of eat anything is kind of fundamental to Pig. Um, Hive, on the other hand, uh, basically comes from this notion of saying, you know, we want to be formal database kind of a thing. We want to speak SQL, uh, SQL-like at least. Um, Pig comes from an ETL world. It uh, appeals to scripters and programmers. Um, Hive appeals to those that are more f familiar with SQL. And fundamentally also, and I think this is crucial, that business intelligence tools are very often written against and assume SQL. Um, they're written against JDBC drivers, ODBC drivers, um, you know, and that actually makes a huge difference. So even if Pig uh, were to add a metadata server associated with all the data that it stores, which is something we tried doing actually, um, at the end of the day, Pig is trying to solve a different use case than what Hive is trying to solve. And it comes down really to stylistic preferences and differences in the communities. Um, what about HBase? I mean, with a name like HBase, which proclaims Hadoop database, um, is that not a database as well? Well, depends on what you mean by database. Uh, HBase is excellent for random read writes. Please do not try to use Hive for a random read write use case. Um, HBase is excellent for billions of rows with millions of columns. Um, again, please, if you ever have a use case that requires millions of columns, do not use Hive. You're just asking for a world of pain. Um, and they're not common use cases for, for relational operations that Hive is really trying to uh, appeal to. And so in terms of optimizations, in terms of what uh, kind of problems are unique to the kind of project, um, the kind of push in the Hive community is a different kind of push. So now, well, we'll talk a little bit about Hitch Catalog, which uh, um, started off essentially as a project called OWL. Uh, which was supposed to try to, which is trying to be a met, another meta store, um, and it was being developed for Pig so that Pig could speak SQL, and uh, we went a small uh, way into this, and then we realized that the Hive meta store already had uh, quite a bit of adoption in the wider community, and we also have uh, it also had quite a few features that were really useful, and we didn't want to necessarily split the community between um, Hive and Pig uh, worlds. We wanted them to talk to each other. So we said, okay, we will build the same kind of storage abstraction notion that we have with, uh, that we're trying to go for that allows interoperability between various projects. And we'll try to build it on top of the Hive Metastore. And so we called it Howl. And as with uh, many of the people that are familiar with Apache trademark uh, processes, there are other projects called Owl, there's other projects called Howl. So, okay, we come up with Hedge Catalog and no other project has that name. Um, so we incubated for a little over a year, and then we got absorbed into the Hive project. And what is Hedge Catalog, really? Um, this line here, which says that it's a metadata-backed storage abstraction, is what it was built to be. But fundamentally, Hedge Catalog is many different things to many different users. It's very much the case of you know, uh, blind people touching different parts of an elephant and feeling that it's many different things. And, um, what it was built to be was so that you can use the Hive Meta Store. Uh, you can use uh, information about tables and, and data, and basically build on uh, build many other high-level tools on top of that, which all communicate with the same notion of the same kind of table and data. And so your notion is that uh, Pig will be able to read and write Hive tables. HBase uh, will be able to kind of uh, be a storage engine for Hive. Um, or other custom tools that are written for kind of workflow management can then uh, understand tables and processes that work on it. So, and another core uh, feature that Hedge Catalog was built for is for data migrations. Um, again, it was kind of a Yahoo specific use case because uh, at that time we were heavily invested in a data format called Zebra, whereas Hive used to live in a world uh, entirely deploying on a file format called RC file. And when you have hundreds of 
uh, you know, terabytes of data that are in one format, it is not easy to go ahead and say, okay, create a new table, last select everything from the old table. Um, yeah, your IT is going to come after you. So what you can do with, uh, and in addition to that, in a lot of cases what winds up happening is you wind up hard coding dependencies. And your program is hard coded to work with, an R, with RC files. And it's a huge production ask to ask people to shift around. Um, so well, uh, what Hedge Catalog allows you to do is you write a MapReduce program to work with Hedge Catalog. And you don't care what the underlying uh, storage system is and you can just quickly manage a few metadata bits, switch it over to a new system, and I mean, say Zebra or whatever other have you, uh, nowadays Arc, um, and what would happen is you would let retention manage your data migration, where all your old data continues to be in RC file, all your new data uh, is written out as Arc, and as far as tables uh, are concerned, it still sees it as a stream of data. And over time, your old data will have been deleted or collected by your retention, uh, uh, what do you say, tools, and your new data will now be ARC. And fundamental to this is this notion of you know, interoperability. Um, I keep talking about common shared metadata and about how that's crucial to what we're doing. Um, well, you you need to be able to access that metadata. How do you go about doing that? Well, services are one way of doing it, and in fact, it is the way of going about it. Services are a well-known abstraction. So at the core of it, uh, before Hedge Catalog, before um, you know, uh, many of these services, what you could do is, if you wrote a tool, you could, well, connect to the MySQL database or whatever database was storing the meta, uh, uh, the, uh, what do you say, metadata, and you could write out your SQL calls. This is bad for several reasons, and the least of which is that metadata changes over time. Basically, you, you are asking for data corruptions, you are asking for assumptions on data models that change over time, and basically, this is asking for production issues. Well, luckily, you have a meta store associated with it. So Hive used to be uh, kind of a fat client which did a lot of the parsing and any other metadata access and then just connect it to a, a database to do its uh, you know, background store. Well, we evolved that slightly saying no, a metadata server is important and this server would work on a thrift interface and basically uh, take connections from other tools or other developers and basically do whatever metadata operations are needed. So associated with that, we have one, one more step of indirection and, a one, and one more step of safety. There's another tool called WebHedgeCat that we've, uh, what do you say, um, that is part of Hedge Catalog, and it's kind of a REST services API on top of um, a lot of tasks, uh, fundamentally written for things like, um, you know, your basic DDL operations like creating a table and, you know, or describing a table, showing partitions and things like that, which allows other tools to interact directly with, uh, what do you say, uh, the Metastore, and that's a useful kind of abstraction. Uh, for people that don't want to connect directly to Thrift or uh, deal with what looks like a lower level interface because essentially the high meta store, even if you know, it's a thrift uh, based uh, uh, ser server, what it does is uh, it is written at a very low level. Um, you have things like add partitions, no transaction. It's like, okay. Um, so it is still low level access and you want to kind of have that at a higher level and WebHCAT solves a bunch of that. And what WebHCAT does for DDL operations um, well, WebHCAT also does some other operations. It allows you to launch Hive queries, launch uh, pig queries, um, uh, basically also launch a custom MapReduce job if you have it. It acts as a generic web service as well. Um, Hive Server 2 is a more recent development, which also is trying to provide services. Um, Hive Server 2 really helps out in the kind of uh, JDBC kind of use cases, or it helps out in cases where um, you have a SQL string and you just want to send that along to Hive as a service, and that's what Hive Server 2 does. Um, fundamentally, um, again, one of the things that Hedge Catalog tries to solve is this notion of API points. And um, it provides an input format, output format abstraction, as I mentioned earlier. It also forms a record abstraction so that you can pretty much treat it as a list of Java, I mean, a Java list of object, and you know, read your row. It also provides a schema uh, a notion associated with that. Uh, it provides a reader and writer interface for those that do not want to um, you know, uh, 
deploy their jobs in a MapReduce task. Um, essentially, for example, Teradata is interested in this because they have uh, connectivity requirements with Hadoop to be able to access data that's on Hadoop, but they don't necessarily want to run inside a MapReduce job. So Hedgecat Reader Writer abstracts away what Hedgecat input format, output format sends, and uh, allows you to do it on a single thread on a separate machine. Um, there's a notifications interface. Uh, Hedgecat can provide JMS notifications for when certain tasks are done, when a partition gets published and things like that. This is really useful in the larger uh, use case from say Uzi where you have a workflow that you want to set up and you want to say run this process, when that finishes trigger this, when this and that are finished trigger this. So that's really useful. Web Hedgecat again has its own uh, you know, uh, REST API associated with it. Um, Hedgecat client was actually initially written to test Web Hedgecat, but primarily it has become a, a neater Java API to connect to the Metastore. And so we have a ton of APIs, um, which is kind of both useful and concerning, because you kind of want to make sure that you're not, um, you're not kind of splitting your efforts and just creating a hodgepodge of various use cases that people don't know what they're going to use and more importantly, is more difficult to maintain. Um, storage Handler is another abstraction that Hive itself provides, which allows um, other systems to kind of uh, manage storage for Hive. Uh, we've talked about uh, HBase interacting with Hive, for example. Um, HBase implements a storage handler and this is kind of uh, interoperability from the bottom level. And in all, you know, everything to do with uh, standards and APIs. This is actually a part that you have to kind of be careful with. Um, and, you know, there's, a, there's always a relevant obligatory XKCD associated with this. And this is a problem that we kind of try to deal with and minimize uh, interaction points. But there are that many relevant use cases that have driven developments on each of those things. Um, with this, I'll pass it over to Methon. And uh, so I will talk, talk about what I will talk about. Go for it. So, um, Right, now uh, Sushant has mentioned a fair few uh, components in the ecosystem as well as how they interact. Um, I thought I would give you an example to illustrate this. Uh, and the example I use is a program that's running in production at Yahoo today. Uh, this project is called Starling. Uh, a little bit of background. Um, Yahoo runs Hadoop at scale, so we have about 25 Hadoop clusters. Each cluster has uh, several thousand nodes, and between them, they process millions and millions of Hadoop jobs every day. Now, um, an interesting byproduct of uh, the Hadoop jobs running is that you get a ton of logs which are specific to Hadoop. For example, you have um, job history, uh, job summaries, file system access, audit logs, you have stack traces from task attempts that failed and so on. So as a data geek, you have to ask yourself, is there anything to be gained by analyzing uh, that data? Now, since this data is in the several hundreds of gigabytes in itself, you might want to actually analyze the Hadoop logs in Hadoop, which then produces further Hadoop logs, which can then be processed again, um, turtles all the way down. So what do we gain from running this sort of analysis? And, and how would you run this kind of analysis? Uh, let's take a few use cases. Um, the first one uh, is probably the easiest one, metering. You might want to go through the job history logs. Um, you can group by user and sum the run times and figure out who is using the most amount of uh, compute on your grids. And you can charge him if you need to. Um, you, can, you can graph the distribution of job types, that is uh, raw map reduce versus pig and hive. And you can gain some insight there. Um, suppose the grid team has shipped pig 11 to the clusters. Now, uh, you might want to go back and look at adoption. You might want to see who's using pig uh, 10 or pig 9 and have them migrate to pig 11 at gunpoint if need be. Um, further down, uh, a little less trivial. Uh, you might want to uh, 
you might want to look at your job failures as well as your um, poorly performing jobs and go into why. For example, you might have jobs whose IO sort MB is set to too low, so your uh, records are being spilled to disk, and so you're losing uh, performance. So you can identify these jobs and either alert the users or uh, a possible future thing is to tune uh, the jobs so that the next time they run, they use a greater uh, IO sort MB. In a similar way, you might have job failures entirely because uh, your YARN containers are too small to accommodate the, um, uh, a larger heap size. So you might want to either auto-tune that, or you might want to uh, alert users or change your uh, uh, cluster defaults. Which brings me uh, to uh, probably my, my favorite use case here. Uh, let's, let's take an example. Uh, let's say there's a data set that captures uh, search logs uh, across Yahoo properties in the US um, aggregated daily. Now, if you were to ask the producer of this data, um, how long do you want this to be retained on HDFS? And this is terabytes of logs. So he's likely to say, oh, maybe a year. Now, uh, that's a number he probably pulled out of his mind. Uh, uh, and it's a pessimistic view. It's, it's probably something that he didn't uh, spend too much time thinking about. Uh, us, on the other hand, we would like to reduce this to a number that's as small as is viable. Now, how would you identify what the ideal retention period should be? So what we did was we let uh, things run with a year's retention. And then over time, we, uh, we checked the file system access and audit logs. We figured out the file creation times and the file last access times. And we uh, plotted graphs. And we saw that for the most part, for most data sets, uh, data that is produced on a certain day is probably hot for that week at best. And, and then it just tapers off. Uh, after three months, you probably don't even need that data. No one's accessing it. So we reduced retention times from a year to three months, and we have saved millions, plural, uh, in HDFS storage. Now, you can, choose to make a, you can choose to make a policy decision here. You could choose to drop replication factor for uh, data that is cold. You can ship it to higher latency storage or probably a faraway cluster that no one's using. Uh, you can delete the data entirely, but all that has to be based on, on hard numbers. And this is kind of how we get our numbers. Uh, all right, enough for the use case. Uh, let's go into how you would build something like this. What would you need? Um, the most boring part of this is probably the parser. Now, the logs, for the most part, are text uh, some of those are JSON. I believe uh, Hadoop 2 uses Avro for uh, uh, job history logs. I'm not sure. But all of this data is on the HDFS. You could write a parser yourself, or you could use or adapt one of the parsers that uh, ships with Hadoop today. Um, that's probably the least interesting part of your solution. What else do you need? Um, let's, let's look at the end game. You probably want uh, to run your analytics in SQL. You probably want uh, the data in, in, after you parse the data, you probably want to store it in, say, MySQL. You can then uh, run uh, SQL queries on it, and you can visualize the data using Tableau, uh, MicroStrategy, or a business intelligence tool of your choice, uh, connecting to, uh, connecting to MySQL probably using uh, ODBC. Um, so we went back and calculated how much uh, processing we would require for given the volumes. And uh, after some amount of mathematical dexterity, we decided that the heavy lifting um, probably ought to be done using Hadoop and Hive. So specifically, 
instead of creating tables in MySQL, we would create those tables in HCatalog using Hive DDL. Uh, you would use MapReduce, the, the parser I was talking about. You could convert that into a MapReduce job, use uh, Hadoop jobs to parse the data, uh, use the HCAT output format to store the data into Hive, into the HCatalog tables. Thereafter, you can query uh, using HiveQL in the same way that you would have uh, used SQL. Um, now, since the data happens to be in uh, HCatalog, uh, because you have the connectors that Sushant was talking about, you can consume that using PIG as well, or MapReduce if you prefer. And, and finally, uh, where you would have used um, Tableau and MicroStrategy, you continue to use Tableau and MicroStrategy, except it is connected uh, over ODBC to Hive Server 2 directly. Um, so, so let's call that the end game. So this is probably how you're going to run your analysis. Um, the solution's not yet complete. You probably want um, a way to um, schedule this processing and probably do the processing in one place. Now, um, you probably don't want to run your parsers in your production clusters because that's taking away resources from, I mean, you're affecting SLAs. So you probably want to pull the raw logs from the HDFSs uh, into a single uh, Starling cluster that you can then process offline. Um, the way to copy data between grids, uh, between uh, clusters, oh, incidentally, this is the uh, sample code that you would use, the, the HCAT DDL, the, uh, the Hive query to find the user that is consuming the most uh, compute, the same query transliterated into PIG, and uh, the JDBC URL you would use to connect your BI tool for Hive Server 2. So back to copying the data. To copy the raw logs, you're probably going to use DCP. Um, uh, DCP ships with Hadoop in, um, uh, it's a very simple tool. What it does is it uses MapReduce to copy files between clusters create a list, break it up, uh, and pass that to different mappers, and it does the copy. Uh, that's a sample command line. Um, if you're familiar with Hadoop, you've likely already used DCP. Um, incidentally, if you've had trouble with uh, DCP on uh, .23 or 2.0, um, please ping me later. That really is my code. Um, and finally, you need a way to um, orchestrate all of this. You need a way to make sure that this runs periodically, perhaps every day. You could have put this at a cron uh, job. Uh, the uh, suggested method for doing this is to use Uzi. Uzi is a workflow manager for Hadoop. It allows you to uh, specify a workflow which contains several actions. In this case, this is a sort of uh, pared down uh, workflow that we uh, use in Starling. Uh, the first action, as you can see, uh, runs a DCP job to copy from source to the Starling cluster. And when that succeeds, uh, the process logs action is called, which, takes, uh, which calls your parser code. So now you have everything in place. You, uh, your Uzi workflow takes care of running this CP, copying the logs over, kicking off your, um, uh, your parse uh, jobs. Uh, the parse job then registers records into uh, Hive tables, and then you, you query and you visualize and so on. So that's how we put uh, Starling together. Um, Here's an example of the sort of analytics that we uh, can do with something like this. Now, now, this data is fairly old and therefore safe to share with you. Um, uh, this data shows uh, job type distributions between clusters. You can see three clumps there. Um, uh, you can see that the cluster in the middle seems to have 
uh, more spikes. Uh, and that's simply because it is a busier cluster. You can see um, uh, the green bits are pig and the orange are MapReduce. And the blue bits are hive. Uh, wasn't really used too much uh, at the time I made this extract. Uh, so this is about a fortnight's worth of data uh, split daily. So um, we can look at the same data uh, diced differently, this time grouped by user. Uh, what we see here is that, uh, so uh, the top and the bottom are, uh, I think one is the number of jobs and the other is uh, total run times. As you can see, there's two users who seem to be using more uh, compute than uh, the others. And uh, they both seem to prefer pig. Um, right, so I'm going to hand this back to Sush now. And he'll take you back to the future. So one of the things that I also wanted to talk to talk about in this talk, if we had enough time, and looks like we do, thankfully, is what's happening with Hive itself and some of the changes that have been happening in the Hadoop e ecosystem that inspire changes in the Hive uh, ecosystem. And one of which is called, you know, uh, is called Project Stinger, and its goal essentially is to try to um, bring. Hive to a point where it can take you make use of the recent changes in done with yarn and if you've heard of Apache Thes. Um, so uh, let's go back to this picture where I talked about how you know a typical MapReduce job kind of uh, spills out. Um, I, I mentioned about how we wind up preparing uh, for a job and then we wind up doing an, an input phase uh, where we do various mapping. And then I said that there was the elephant in the room, which basically is a short shuffle, uh, shuffle stage, uh, which basically is uh, you know, mostly hidden. There's a reduce stage where you're doing some sort of aggregation and you're finally outputting uh, you know, whatever you have over here. And realistically, this part is actually significant in terms of IO costs. If you consider, um, if you consider one of the things that you hear of in big data stories most of the time, it is that I.O. dominates things. It is not about CPU utilization most of the time. It is about you being I.O. blocked. Whether it's local hard disk or network read writes, uh, you should never be network read write blocked as far as possible. Um, and you should always try to keep things local. Uh, but even local hard disks are only that fast. So what you have is, in many cases, uh, when you run a Hive query, what winds up happening is it winds up getting represented as a sequence of MapReduce jobs. Um, going back to when I said that Hive was a database engine, well, it has this notion of storage abstractions. It has this notion of what tables are logically. And then it's able to try and say, OK, if this person wanted me to select this, filter by that, group this, this translates to me to a MapReduce job followed by another MapReduce job followed by another MapReduce job. I mean, for example, it can be much more complex than this. But let's look at this picture again here. Um, as per the previous slide, you remember that after a mapper, you have to uh, dump to disk and you wind up doing this whole uh, sort shuffle thing before it goes to the reducer, right? Now, if this is temporary data that we are concerned about, then the reducer does need not necessarily strictly need to write out to disk. But you will have a scenario where this is necessary. So in something like a map reduce, map reduce, map reduce chain that winds up happening like this, if you could just rearrange your blocks so that you had a mapper followed by this reducer and fed that data in memory to the next mapper, and so on and so forth, and made it more like a chain, like an M, RM, RM, R kind of a chain, then what you wind up with is you don't need to spill to disk at this, in between this reducer and the mapper. You don't need to spill to disk in between this reducer and mapper. So you save on a bunch of IO costs associated with this. The first picture here actually has something like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Essentially, after every block, uh, a hard disk write. In the second block, you only need to write four times. And that is actually, the savings that you get on that are actually huge. But 
when you try to shoehorn everything into a MapReduce framework classically, you wind up having to say, oh, I launched a MapReduce job. I have to wait for that to finish before I can you know, shoot off another. But you realize that these kind of chains are much more useful. So with Yarn, uh, there is a new project called Apache Taze, uh, which basically tries to be a Yarn container that deals with input, processing, output. It deals more with the notion of vertices and edges of a DAG, uh, of a workflow DAG, um, than with, uh, what do you say, uh, strictly MapReduce kind of paradigm. So now we start looking at maps and reduce tasks as simply some sort of processing. And the question of what kind of processing do you need to take before you uh, do something else? And in this scenario, for example, I have, uh, I listed out a slightly more complex DAG for uh, some sort of Hive query. And you know, we wind up saying that we wanted to do a MapReduce job followed by um, two other MapReduce jobs, which have similar mapping. So if you had, for example, a group by, or you had a filter that resulted in uh, creating a map task that did the same operation, but the reduced task did something completely different. And then you use these two, uh, the resultant data of both of those together in a join that uh, eventually fed to another MapReduce program. Then you might get some, uh, a DAG that looked like this. But again, we have one right here, another right here, another, 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 and one more and one more. So every block here is writing out. And so that's a total of eight disk writes that we're looking at. If you rearrange that picture, again, to kind of a M, RM cycle kind of a thing, then we can actually arrange it in this way, where the M2, which is common between both of these, can be actually be attached to the R1, and this becomes an in-memory uh, data transfer. And same with this, and same with this. So now we are actually down to one write, two writes, three, four, and five writes. So from eight writes, we come down to five writes. And essentially, these kinds of optimizations are huge in, uh, in terms of the kind of uh, savings that Hive actually has. And in a sense, we are moving with Apache Thes to a more conventional, uh, what do you say, input processing output kind of a idea. And uh, what it can do for something like uh, a Hive database engine is it is strictly not a MapReduce engine anymore. And you know the future will tell what kind of additional things we do for this. But this already is, uh, what do you say, making a huge amount of performance gains. Uh, with Hive 0 0.13 that's just coming out, um, you should be able to set uh, execution engine equal to TEZ, pace, and you should actually see quite a bit of faster performance with a bunch of things. And associated with this, um, coming back to the theme of interoperability. Um, potentially, Hive is now just producing phase blocks. And there is no reason why we cannot try to adapt this to additional kinds of processing that uh, what do you, uh, you know, uh, other, uh, other projects are able to also provide for these blocks. And so essentially, we will become much more expressive as things go on. Um, that concludes our talk, and I open the floor to any questions that you might have. All right, thank you very much.